Wow, guys, today's podcast was a great one. You're going to love this. I interviewed Matt Doherty. Matt is an executive coach and author, but most importantly, he has an amazing story around fulfilling his lifelong dream only to lose that opportunity three years into it. Matt played at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, under Coach Dean Smith with Michael Jordan, Sam Perkins, James Worthy, and several other uh, you know, NBA greats. Uh, he was on that team and started on that team with Michael Jordan. He then went on to other coaching opportunities, became a coach at um, uh, Notre Dame, and then was called to coach at Chapel Hill. He got the job at Chapel Hill only to lose that opportunity three years later. And on today's podcast, he's going to tell you that story. He's going to tell you the journey. He's going to openly talk about the pain that he experienced when that was taken away from him. And he's going to talk about how he worked through that, how he was resilient and the principles that he applied to learn and grow from that. But it wasn't without some struggle and it wasn't without some pain, but there is some great teachings in this. So enjoy. My guest today is Matt Doherty, and you are going to love this. I was able to talk with Matt a little bit before the show started here, and I know you're going to get a lot out of this, a lot of leadership lessons, a lot of life lessons. Matt currently runs the Doherty Coaching Practice and works in a variety of media and private businesses. Um, he's also the author of Rebound, From Pain to Passion. I can tell you I've read this book from cover to cover. I've actually gone back through it and made some notes and dog-eared several sections um, there's a, it, there's some great life lessons in here, and we're going to talk about that today. But his story starts back at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He played basketball under the legendary coach, Dean Smith, and with his teammates who were Michael Jordan, James Worthy, Sam Perkins, and Kenny Smith, to name a few others, literally the who's who of college basketball for that era. After winning a national championship playing for Chapel Hill and finishing finishing his collegiate career, Matt went on to coaching roles at Davidson, Kansas, before being tapped to be the head coach of the Notre Dame basketball program. Then he was awarded his dream job of being the head coach of the UNC Tar Heels, his alma mater. We'll speak about that role at Chapel Hill during this interview. And in fact, Matt has great lessons to share. Um, his book uh, and, and the lessons in that are just timeless. So let's just get to it. Matt, welcome to the Thrive More Show. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, Roger. Thanks for having me on. You betcha. My pleasure. My pleasure. And, um, you know, I found as I as I read this book, uh, Rebound, it, it almost felt like a cathartic book for you to read. As a reader, I could feel the the lessons, but the but also, you know, you've you've had some challenging times in your life. And I could read how you've you've learned from those, not just, you know, got through them, but you've taken these huge life lessons from that. So yeah, let's start at the beginning because you know it's it's I think for the for the listeners it's always great to know okay well where did this guy come from like what happened so you know you had this great um, uh, and you talk about it in your book um, young career in, in high school basketball and have always been playing ball and, and and got better and worked harder than you know a lot harder than the average bear so to speak but you had the chance to go to Chapel Hill and, and play for Dean Smith so if you can go back in time. And, and kind of talk about that and what it felt like to walk onto that campus and his first practice. Yeah, I fell in love with uh, Carolina basketball. Probably it started in 1976. I was in eighth grade. Uh, Dean Smith was coaching the Olympic team. They won the Olympics in Montreal. Uh, there were four Tar Heels on that team, Walter Davis, Mitch Kupchak, Tommy Lagarde, and Phil Ford. And then the next year, 1977, they went to the Final Four. And they had a guy named Michael Korn, who was a freshman, 6'7", white guy from New Jersey. And, you know, I'm 6'7", white guy from New York. So uh, I looked at o o Mike and like thought like, oh, man, I I'd like to be like him. And I just was captivated by the way North Carolina played. Then to be recruited by them and have Dean Smith come into my home to visit with my family and I about coming to North Carolina was really amazing. I remember when he showed up at my door, it was kind of like surreal. <laughs> and then a couple of months later, I take a visit 
I had visited a couple other schools, Duke, Virginia. I was scheduled to visit Notre Dame. But after my visit to North Carolina, I, I kind of knew that's where I wanted to go. And they they hadn't even, school wasn't even in session. It was fall break. Mm. And they just started basketball practice. And I just loved the way they practiced. Uh, I loved the camaraderie of the team. And I thought that, uh, you know, with Coach Smith's core values, um, their system, that I, I could be a fit for that program. Yeah, yeah. What was it like? So you played, and it was your it was your second year you won a championship. Is that correct? That's right. That's yeah. Right. Okay. And on that team was a young freshman named Michael Jordan. Yep. And and did you know? Of course, we all know who Michael is today and what he's accomplished. But you had a front row seat to watching greatness before it ever became greatness. And and I just can't help but ask, what. Well, was it obvious? Did, 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 did the other team members know, or was it just, he was just another player? Well, oh gosh, it's a, it's a tough question to answer. Jim Beeline, who coached at Michigan had a great line. He said, fit in before you stand out. And, you know, Michael had obvious talent, but he really tried to fit in. And I think that's part of his greatness. You know, he wanted to, be coached. He wanted to learn. Uh, he was eager to learn. And, um, you know, the more he learned, the more he was freed up to let his talents shine. Right. Uh, and I think he really absorbed the fundamentals that coach Smith taught and realized that once you kind of master those and, and coach Smith had a saying, a disciplined person is a truly free person. Mm. And that's kind of, as a young person, I didn't really understand that. But the more disciplined we are with our decisions about money, relationships, alcohol, drugs, they were free yeah. to choices as opposed to people making choices for us yeah. uh, because we're in debt or jail or, you know, uh, you know, don't have a good job. And so Michael really uh, absorbed the fundamentals and learned from the other players, uh, but yet his talent would just blossom at certain times during practice. And I um, remember one of the first times he drove baseline and hung for like a half hour <laughs> and then decided to kiss the ball off the glass. I'm like, hmm, I'm not seeing that before. <laughs> um, and then the summer after his freshman year, and I think this is where a lot of growth happens for a lot of, a lot of players. Uh, he was playing in the summers against the NBA players that would come back. And there was a great NBA player that Michael was going against. And Michael was really, you know, giving it to him. And I remember saying to myself, like, Michael, like this guy's jerseys, I'm in the stands, Michael, like take it easy on him. His jerseys in the rafters Take you know, show him more respect but Michael was just a vicious competitor yeah. who had an abundance of talent and was also, I, I don't think people give him enough credit for his intelligence yeah. as a player. Um, the mind games he would play, the self awareness he had and the emotional intelligence intelligence he had about the players around him. Yeah. We're, we're actually uh, in my notes. I want to talk a little bit later about emotional intelligence because you refer to it. Um, and Fran Johnston, I, I, I know her from a previous life. So it's a small world, no right? Way. Yeah. Very small world. Um, let's talk about you've competed at the highest level of collegiate athletes as, as a, as a player, but also as a coach. And I think anybody who's ever watched college, bat, there are so many life lessons I believe to be found in, in college basketball particularly but you know it's it to me you know, that's why march madness is so crazy because anything can happen it's the highest of highs the lowest of lows kind of just talk to us about that roller coaster of athletics at that level and and and, and you know, i think most importantly for the listeners because we'll never play at that level what were the life lessons that you took from that that you could apply to your parenting to apply to your, your yeah. business ventures yeah i, I think I, I think this is sounds self-serving but um I do think that people that have played sports, especially team sports, do have, um, I don't want to say, well, an advantage. They, they have a, a database that they can draw upon when they get into business. Yeah. 
because in sports, you're bringing a team together. Uh, you have a vision, you have a mission, you have core values, you have uh, goals, you define roles. Uh, and I think one of the biggest lessons is you deal with failure hmm. uh, as a team and individual failure. And I think that uh, sometimes people have had success. They've gone to great schools. Uh, they start their own business or they get into business. And the first time they get uh, someone tells them no, or they get fired or, or they're, you know, they're an entrepreneur and the, they go bankrupt. That's really hard. And I think as an athlete, we fail a lot, like, and it's public. So, <laughs> you know, you, one minute you're being pat on the back. And then I remember, um, you know, my first year, my third year, we first year, we didn't go to the final four. Uh, we lost to Georgia in, in Syracuse. I remember going out like that, you know, Saturday night in town and people talking junk to me in a bar that, you know, we were losers and we didn't get to the final four, you know? And so you got to deal with that. And, and he, I, I, I listen to a lot of business books and most business books, leadership books, use draw on parallels from sports yeah you know uh teamwork getting the ball across the goal line um you know getting sacked you know defining roles and so there's really a lot of carryover and i think the biggest thing is dealing with failure yeah i never thought of it that way yeah i man that's universe conspiring i, I went on a walk which i don't do often because he doesn't live in, in town but with my 19 uh, year old son last night and, you know, it's one of those father son walks. And, and I told him, I said, you know, pain is the only way you're going to learn lessons. Like we don't grow until there's pain, you know, and, and I, it's really the only, like winning doesn't teach us a whole lot. It's fun, no. but it's the pain that, that we grow from. And, and I, I, you're right, man, that failure after failure with what Winston Churchill, no, no loss of enthusiasm is, is, right. uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. I love Winston Churchill quotes. Yeah. Um, uh, what a wise man he was. For sure. For sure. Um, well, speaking of wise men, uh, Matt, you have a quote in your book and, and it's life is a series of decisions and dealing with the consequences, the better decisions you make, the better your life will be. And you said you've repeated that countless times to young people. Of course, my first, the easiest question is why? Well, I, I think that I'm fundamental. I'm a coach. So I'm pretty pragmatic, um, literal, logical, you know, A plus B equals C. I love math in high school. Um, I like things that make sense. And uh, it's pretty logical. Like if I make a good decision to go to a good school, to hang around good people, uh, to save my money, to work hard, to get good grades, then I have a better chance of being successful. Uh, and, you know, you, we have to define our own success, right? Sure. What do we want? You know, if you want to get to a place where you have a career you enjoy and you can make a good living at it. Well, what do you need to do to get there? Yeah. Who do I need to meet? What books do I need to read? Um, and you know, do I get up early? Do I take care of my body? Do I study? Do I work out? Do I, you know, what does your day look like? And then you know, credit card debt. Like I, I talked to a lot of kids about credit card debt, you know, and these are lessons I learned as a youngster from my parents. Like if you can't, if you don't have the money in the bank to back up the credit card purchase you're getting ready to make, then don't purchase it. And never, never, never carry over a balance from one month to the next. Those are good decisions. You know, so the better your life will be. It's common sense, but common sense isn't so common. Isn't so common. So yeah. I try to instill those fundamentals in young people because I think they're good lessons. And um, I had, had a I had a player one time at SMU tell me, you know, thanks for teaching me about credit card debt. Like, you know, as a coach or a teacher, and yeah. and so making good decisions. Uh, you know, I made a great decision to attend the University of North Carolina and yeah. it impacted the rest of my life in a positive way. Yeah. I, I think as a coach, you are also unique in, in a very unique position that as a parent, 
we can say something as a, as a you know as an uncle or a sibling uh, a coach as a there's a certain reverence for, and there should be for for a coach that and and I sometimes wish that more coaches would realize the power that they have beyond the sport right beyond the sport to make an impact in a young person's life and it sounds like you yeah, did that I, I've often told a kid I have <laughs> I've asked them so I said do you uh, make your bed in the morning and uh, the mother like would come back to me like after camp like. I want you to know my son's making his bed now. <laughs> like, and you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. And so it's human nature. Like, I look back and think of the things my dad told me. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I should have listened to him more. And I think of my son, you know, and and so that's why it's important to put our kids around good people yeah. that um, may support the things that we believe in and yeah, they'll listen to their coach more because the coach has a little more leverage um, and the coach, you know, doesn't care as much about the young person's feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They, 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 they care about the feelings, but not as much as a parent. Yeah. It's a parent, you know, kids, we, we, we tend to, uh, I don't know, take for granted or willing to say things to people we love that can be hurtful more than people we don't know as well. Yeah. You know, we can make a comment to a spouse, to a child or a parent that may be offensive because we know they're not going anywhere. Yeah. I don't know. We take them for granted. And then we're also at home, our default mode, we're tired, but we're on guard around our coaches and our bosses. Yeah. And so there's a little more level of respect probably that is maybe misplaced, but it's just human nature. Yeah. Yeah. I think they call that wisdom too, right? Growing, realizing that you said you would listen. I wish I would listen to my dad more. Uh, Mark Twain's got a famous quote when, when my dad was 16, I couldn't believe how ignorant he was. And by the time he, I turned 21, I was amazed at what he'd learned. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just yeah. life. Yeah. That um, is true. So uh, you actually, a after college, um, as I recall in the book, uh, got drafted to Cleveland, but released before you could play. Talk to, talk to me about that, because that's like that's every young college player's dream to get drafted. And it happened to you, and then it doesn't manifest. I go back to, I think it was June 19th, 1984, draft day. Um, you know, my whole life, I dreamed of playing in the NBA. I uh, started four, three years at North Carolina. Started on the national championship team. You know, you'd like to think you're going to get drafted yeah. fairly high. For me, in my mind, I was hoping to be drafted by, the, you know, in the third round. Mm -hmm. Thought that was realistic. Nowadays, they don't even have three rounds. They only have two rounds. So I go to a camp to speak at a camp. The draft wasn't as big a deal back then, but it was, I think, during the day. I think they brought, I don't know if Michael, I don't even know if Michael was at the draft that day. Maybe he was. But I'm speaking at a camp at Campbell, now University, in Bowie's Creek. And <laughs> I remember before my talk, I, I, there's like 700 campers at this camp. It's like the largest camp in the country. I, I go to a payphone and put a quarter in to call the basketball office in North Carolina to see if I was drafted yet. No, no word. I talked to Linda Woods, Coach Smith's secretary. No word. A little concerned. You know, another 30 minutes, go back to the payphone. No word. Now I'm really concerned. And uh, so it's my turn to go out and speak to the campers. And I'm trying to keep focused on the campers and I'm in the middle of my talk. All of a sudden, there's a tap on my shoulder, and it's the camp director. And I, you know, lean my head down. He gets in my ear and whispers, six round Cleveland. And uh, I turn around, and my eyes are stinging. My body goes numb. I'm doing everything I can, Roger, to fight back the tears. Wow. Six round Cleveland, like Cleveland was the worst team in the NBA. Six round, like they start drafting 
you know, uh, I don't know if I can say it now, but females, <laughs> sure. women, you know, uh, you know, like the sixth round is not where you want to go. Sure. Like very few players get, make it after the third round. Yeah. So I'm fighting back tears in front of 700 campers. And I remember driving home after camp back to my apartment, in Chapel Hill, the next morning, if, if you remember radio alarm clocks, the radio alarm goes off and it goes right to sports and the local sports, ACC players drafted and it goes through a list of draft picks. And it mentioned Rick Carlisle, who's now the coach of the Pacers, uh, third round Celtics. As soon as I heard that, I started crying. Mm. Like that's where I was, that's where I was supposed to be picked. You know, what do you learn from that? So anyway, I, I, I felt betrayed by basketball. Yeah, yeah. I left and turned my back and said, screw you, basketball. I'm going to work in New York on Wall Street. I'm going to make a lot of money. I don't need you. Yeah. And after four years, I was miserable. And, and I don't mind saying this. I've shared this recently. Um, you know, I came to the realization that I had a drinking problem. I gave up alcohol. I met with a counselor, went to AA. And I know I was drinking because I was miserable. Self-medicating. Um, Self-medicating, yeah. And, and, uh, and stopped drinking, quit my job, moved to Charlotte. 11 years later, I'm the head coach at Notre Dame. So I go back to decisions. <laughs> yeah. Like people now, when they ask, well, what's, what's the thing you're most proud of? Well, I was giving up drinking in 1987. Because by doing that, I got into coaching and ended up being the head coach at Notre Dame and meeting my wife. Uh, and, you know, had I been drinking, I probably wouldn't have achieved those things that yeah. I achieved. Yeah. So that was a de decision, a good decision I made. With great consequences. Um, yeah. With, yeah. 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 And so, um, and then, you know, the year after that, I'm the head coach at North Carolina and I went to national, you know, voted national coach of the year. Yeah. And that all started when I stopped drinking. Uh, well, one, congratulations, because that's Thanks. a tough road, but um, one that's so important, so important. Oh, I was blessed, man. Listen, yeah. I went to AA for maybe a couple weeks, moved to Charlotte, and never felt tempted to have another drink in my life. Yeah. So I am truly blessed uh, to say that. And, uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with going out socially and someone having a drink and i'm not like yeah prop doesn't bother me well thanks thanks for sharing that though too that thank you thank that um yeah. this thrive more this show is about real stuff and 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 real challenges that we have in life because again pain is the greatest teacher and i appreciate you open up yeah about no that. listen i like to yeah. get real roger otherwise uh you know if we're just talking about the weather <laughs> uh and 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 the 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 yankees um you know that's too shallow for me. I don't, I don't, that's, I, I like to go deep quick. Amen. 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 All right. So you get the phone, you're at, you're at Notre Dame, uh, which of course, you know, has their legendary football program. Um, and, and, uh, for all the listeners out there, Matt goes deep into what he did in Notre Dame and, and, and they didn't have a renowned basketball program. And he really made it a requirement that they invest in their program with, with the, the stuff he did there. But you get that call. And, and, and it's for Chapel Hill, you know, it's, it's the Tar Heels, right? Only, there's only a couple programs when you, that are synonymous with, with the, with the words college basketball. And that's one of them. What's going through your mind? Well, I remember, uh, I'm on the golf course. I, I finished my first year at Notre Dame. We have a good season. I'm on the golf course with my assistant, Doug Wojcik and the phone rings and it's nine one nine area code. And, uh, I look at it and I listen to the message and find out that Bill Guthridge just retired. And, uh, I, I sculled my next two shots, um, as my mind was thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh, well, Roy Williams is going to take the job and Kansas will be open. That's where I was an assistant for seven years. That's right. Yep. So I'm thinking like, what, what the, what the possibilities are. And then my wife and I 
and our kids and Fred Quarterbaum, another assistant, um, we're going to a cabin on Lake Michigan. And I get up there and my mind's just mush. So I say, I got to call Coach Smith. And well, I can't call from the cabin because there's no cell phone service. Yeah. So I got to go find some place near the lake in St. Joe, I think it was, Michigan. And I get him on the phone and I said, uh, Coach, you know, if, you know, when, when Roy takes the North Carolina job, if Kansas calls, because he was a Kansas graduate, if Kansas calls, should I consider it or should I stay at Notre Dame? And his words were, well, it's not a done deal with Roy yet. You're still on the short list. I'm like, short list at North Carolina. So I'm like, well, that's a no brainer. Like, and that was my response. So I hang up. Like, literally two weeks later, I'm in Coach Smith's office and he's asking me, can you take the job? And I said, I said, well, I got to talk to my wife. And in typical Coach Smith fashion, he said, well, just two weeks ago, you said it was a no brainer. Oh. I love it. Called you out. Called you out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, then Michael Jordan called me and coach Smith had Michael call me. And, you know, once, once there was a hint that they could go outside the Carolina family, I just felt that I needed to take the job. Sure. And I think that's the, the button coach Smith knew that he could push on me because talk about emotional intelligence and that, that guy was one of the smartest people I've ever been around in my life. And wow. he knew what buttons to push on people. Yeah. And that was the button that would get me to leave Notre Dame to come back to North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. So you walk in and you, you talk about this, uh, in depth in, in your book rebound, but if you can kind of talk to listeners about you come into North Carolina and you, you're very open about this in the book. You did a lot of things right, but you admit in the book that there are several things that you would change, that you yeah. would do differently. Um, what did you, first, let's start, what did you do right? Because we also want to learn from, you know, how do you, because you talk about managing change is one of the trickiest things in business, and that's change. Like, you're coming into the program yep. uh, that is, a, you know, a steeped in, in, in tradition. But So what, what did you write that if people were going to take over a new job, a new role, they get a promotion, you know, what, what lessons could they take from what you did well? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I think that's a short list as I look back. You know, I think I asked the right questions. You know, uh, will it be my program to run? Mm -hmm. um, I did explain to them my first year would be good. The second year would be bad. The third year we'd, we'd be rebuilding, trying to set expectations. I asked if I could bring my own staff with me. Because I knew, you know, that the previous staff had all former players and, you know, the, w would that be okay? And if it wasn't, I could stay at Notre Dame. Um, you know, I, I, I think I probably made more mistakes than, than positives. I, I, I you know, once I started coaching the team, I, I was about control what you can control. And yeah. I, I think we control conditioning. Um, and we were in good shape. We played pretty hard. Uh, we did have a system in place. I, I talk about the organizational triangle, Roger. Every organization is made up of the organizational triangle, as I call it, talent systems and culture. Okay. So, you know, you recruit your talent. You have to have a good system in place. You know, how do you meet? How do you play uh, business or sports? And then your culture. But the culture is most important. Culture is king. Yep. You could have great systems, great talent, but if you have a bad culture, you're not going to be successful. The thing about Coach Smith, he had a great system and great culture. And so I try to drive uh, an intense culture. And the thing, a couple of things, I got the job late. Like it is July. We're recording this July 10th. Yep. I got the job July 11th. Now, anybody that knows anything about college basketball knows that's late. Yep. Like most coaches get their jobs in March or April. Um, West Virginia just made a coaching change. You would see Charlotte made a coaching change in June. And they decided to go with an interim because it was too late in the process. So I'm on the road recruiting for Notre Dame. I get pulled off the road and take the North Carolina job. 
And literally, school's going to start in about five weeks. Wow. And I have to be on the road recruiting because that's the most important thing, really, one of the most important things a college coach can do. Yeah. But there was a lot of collateral damage. I had four secretaries, actually four and a half. I had a part-time secretary. But the four main secretaries probably were there an average of 20 to 25 years each. Jeez. And, you know, they were a family. And here I come in, even though I played there, I'm bringing in a new staff. The previous staff is now, you know, labeled that I fired them, but I'm like, I didn't hire them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's controlling the narrative, managing change. And, and I started to work with an executive coach and uh, remember him saying that, you know, don't move the furniture within 25 feet of someone's desk without their input. So I was making change. I was good at making change. Yeah. Can you just step it back once that you said controlling the narrative and that's a big phrase, right? Because that's, that's part of change and, and, and managing change. Just, can you open up just a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I think it comes down to communication, right? And, and you know, like you need to go slow. Well, first of all, I, I talk in my book about the six no's of leadership, but I use the acronym STEVIT, S-T-V, S-T-E-V-I-T. You got to know yourself. You got to know your team. You got to know your environment. So my environment, Notre Dame, they welcomed change. They wanted change. So when I came through the front door like a bolt of lightning, they were good with it. So I was successful in, ma in managing change at Notre Dame. North Carolina, in my mind, needed the same change, but they had 35 years of massive success. Yep. They didn't think they needed change. Yeah. And by the way, the two previous coaches were in the building, mm. Dean Smith and Bill Guthridge. So, you know, you're in business, you take over a business. Does the previous CEO stick around? No. You walk the out the front door. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now it was hard for me to control the narrative. Yeah. Because I'm coming in and people may still, they're still looking at Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge who show up every day. And eventually the two, two of the four secretaries that worked for me weren't happy with the change. They quit and they ended up working for Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge in the building. That can be toxic. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you have former players calling, you have reporters calling, and it just takes one thing like, well, it's different. <laughs> Little, right? I call that a snipe. Yeah. The passive aggressive yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so controlling the narrative, if I had to do it again, I would have done a couple a couple different things. I would have stayed at Notre Dame. Yep. Or taken the job and let Coach Smith run the program through me and kept the previous staff, but brought my staff with me so I didn't leave them out in the cold yep. and somehow figured out a way to combine the staffs. I would have met with the secretaries and not gone out on the road recruiting right away. I would have gone slower with change yeah. and, 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 you know, let coach Smith really be the almost like, uh, I don't know if you run EOS in your company. We actually do. Yeah. Okay. So coach Smith, let him be the visionary. I'd be the integrator. Yeah. Yep. Instead, you know, I was being the visionary, uh, probably and the integrator, and and I didn't know how to. I'm, I'm listening to a good book now, CEO Excellence, and it talks about managing to up to the board. And Coach Smith was on the board, like technically he wasn't on the org chart. Like my boss was the athletic director, but it really was Dean Smith, and I didn't manage that relationship because he's retired. Yeah. And I'm a former player and I revered him and I didn't want to bother him. Like I, I didn't have a relationship with him ever where I felt like I could just call him and chat. Sure. So now I remember one of his friends called me, said, you know, you need to call coach. You, you should call coach Smith more. And I'm thinking he's retired. He don't want me to bug him, but 
that's where I lacked emotional intelligence and in thinking that, you know what? He created this baby. He still wants to be a part of it. He needs to be included. This is his life. It's a huge part of his life. I need to let him in and give him more access. I mean, he'd come to practice. I'd meet with him the next morning, go over the notes he took. He'd watch a game. I'd meet with him the next day. So I had regular interaction. It wasn't like I shut him out. Sure. But he needed more. And I should have recognized that. And uh, that was my inexperience. Um. Yeah, lack of emotional awareness. Uh, so, hey, did more things wrong than it did sure, things right. Sure, sure. But you just gave a gift to well, one to me, but also the listeners of this podcast because what you said, Notre Dame wanted the change. They needed the change, right? So you can't go slow. You have to go fast. But you, you were coming into UNC was a very established program. And yeah, they needed change, but you kind of have to go at the pace that the situation allows. And, and those of us that are drivers, we have one speed, full bore, full bore. Uh, and that doesn't always work as we, as we, you know, you learn in life, you learn in life. Um, you, and I referenced it earlier, but you, uh, you created, got, uh, got into a relationship, a uh, professional relationship with Fran Johnston, who uh, at the time, at least I knew her was at Telios leadership. I don't know if that's still her. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I worked in a pharmaceutical company that had hired her. My boss's name was um, Fred Graff, and he had brought her in, and uh, and they really helped us with leadership development and coaching and, and emotional intelligence. That's where I got exposed to Dan Goldman and and, the, and that yep. whole thing. And you've mentioned emotional intelligence a couple times. I think it's a term that's kind of thrown about in in culture these days. But but you know you obviously have lived it and and grown from it, uh, and then had you know what I would consider some of the best uh, one-on-one -on -one coaching available in, 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 in the business world from Fran, can you speak to how the light bulb started to go off for you with emotional intelligence? Because emotional intelligence is a learned behavior, correct? Like this. Yes. Yeah. That's important. And, and yeah. Like, uh, my hair's raising up when you just said that. Uh, wow. Uh, so there's political unrest. My third year, I go from the national coach of the year, number one in the country, eight and 20 worst record in Carolina basketball history rebuilding. We beat Kansas and Roy Williams in the garden in the preseason in IT. Sean May, my starting center, breaks his foot. We win 19 games, but we don't make the NCAA tournament. It was an, a, an excuse. You know, there's political unrest. Sure. There was an excuse then to get rid of me. They bring Roy, Roy in. So, yeah, I'm forced to resign. And, uh, you know, what do you do? Well, this is where your personal board of directors come into play. And I, Bob Bodine, who I had on my re podcast, Rebound podcast, uh, recorded this morning, was the first person who sh gave me that term. I heard that term. So on my personal board of directors was Kevin White, who was ironically uh, the athletic director at Notre Dame that I left <laughs> to take the North Carolina job. Oh and then became the AD at Duke, he calls me and said, uh, take the high road, there's less traffic up there. I love that. Love that. Right? Because because in that emotion, now, now like, I don't have my sports information director. I, my, my wife's mad. I'm mad. I'm in disarray. That's when, like, the sound bites... <laughs> You know, you say something and that that's going to last a long time. Long time, yeah. And then a friend of mine, John Black, on my personal board of directors, said, you need to go on a leadership journey and go work with Carol Weber at UVA. And he worked with her in business. She's an executive coach who also teaches at the Darden School. So I'm one of those guys, uh, Roger, that if you tell me to work on my left hand, I'm going to work on my left hand so much it becomes better than my right hand. So I, I go to the Darden School, work with Kara Weber. I go to Wharton. My brother went to Wharton. And these are just executive coach sure, classes, sure. Like one-week classes. Like, you don't have to try to get admitted. Like, yeah. But they, they'll take your money. <laughs> and so, so, and then I work with an executive coach in Chapel Hill, who I'd worked with the previous few years named Jerry Bell. So I'm like, all right. 
you know, you can either get bitter or better. I wanted to get better. And I think this is, goes back to sports. You know, when you, as a coach or a player, lose a game, what do you do? You watch the film, you take notes, and you implement it in your next practice to get better. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, they told me I wasn't a good leader. So I met with Kara Weber. I went to class at Wharton, and the, the instructor in my first class was Fran Johnson, and she's teaching out of the Daniel Goldman book, Primal Leadership, The Art of Emotional Intelligence. We're reading in the book, and it says leadership's a learned behavior. It's the most exciting thing I ever read, Roger, because at that point, I was told that I wasn't a good leader, and I started to believe them. Yeah. And she's talking about emotional intelligence, and this is 2003. And I'm like, emotional intelligence? I've never heard of emotional yeah. intelligence. And if I would have heard about and learned about emotional intelligence, I might still be the head coach of North Carolina. So I went up to Fran after class, introduced myself. She said, you know, I, I, I'm aware of who you are, what you've been through, and, you know, let's talk. Well, she agreed to be my executive coach, uh, so I would fly up from Charlotte to Philly once a month on my own dime, fly up and back the same day, meet with Fran. I've cried in front of Fran. I've hugged Fran. I've laughed in front of Fran. Uh, I mean, you talk about people that have had an impact on your life. Yeah. Um, she's top five, wow. uh, for me and I'm grateful uh, your life's impacted by three things, the people you meet, the books you read and the trauma in your life. Yeah. And that all came <laughs> together. The, that window where the trauma of losing my job, meeting Fran, reading primal leadership, the yeah. art of emotional intelligence, man. I don't know if they were all supposed to be shoved together like that, but you got it all out of the way. Yeah. Well, I'm a driver like you, uh, right. You know, like, I want to go through it. Like, yeah, let's go. I, it was, uh, it was the express lane for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. It was neat to see you light up right there. That was because you obviously made, uh, you know, personal growth is not this. I think we're all taught that career and personal, it's not, it's, it is such a winding, you know, up and down road. Um, but it, it sounds like once you got into that coaching relationship with a friend that, that you just, you had a hockey stick moment of, of, of growth. And it just, just talk about that a little bit. Between Fran, Carol Weber, Jerry Bell, um, I did uh, personality assessments, Myers-Briggs with Carol Weber. And I remember I walked in and I was beaten up. That was the first person I met with after I lost my job. And I'm beaten up and I'm in her home office and, you know, small talk. She did some research on me and then she goes to the Myers-Briggs results and she says, you're an ENTJ. And I said to myself, you know, I've been called a lot of four letter words, but never an ENTJ. And uh, she tells me an ENTJ, only 2% of the population are ENTJs. And like, I'm starting to sit up now. Like, yeah, I, I, I am elite. <laughs> like only 2% of the population, like Carolina just got rid of an elite coach. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm thinking. And she says, she, she can read my mind. She goes, no, no, you, you, you don't get it. That means 98% of the population don't think like you think. <laughs> yeah. And that's like, I hit my help myself my, in the forehead and I'm going, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And then with Jerry Bell, I did 360s. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the people that I worked with, the secretaries, my former assistants, and asked them to do that for that me. That took courage, brother. Wow. And they did it. And I got the results. And I'm sitting there. I was at the beach at the time, reading them in this office at, the, at, a, at a beach house. Somebody lent to me. And, you know, when you read words in black and white, like if somebody says something to you, you could discount it a little bit. When it's black and white, like you, you go back and you like you read it, you go back like, yeah, it's still there. It's still like there. They're not backing down from that comment. Yeah. Like I could challenge you. You could say, Matt, you're a jerk. I'll say, Roger, you know, and I'll go back and you like, okay, yeah, yeah, oh. back down. But like, no, it basically says jerk, <laughs> jerk. 
And I'm like, oh my God. Like that's somebody took the time to write that. And a friend of mine uh, who's an executive coach said, you know, the truth's a gift. Mm. Those things were so impactful. And again, I said to myself, I wish I would have had this knowledge before I was a head coach. Now, would I have sought it out? Would I would it would it have stuck? You know, uh, did I need this experience? So um yeah, all those people uh, I'm grateful for. And Fran, you know, she just gave me a new perspective on some of the things that I was feeling. And, and then it could validate my feelings. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, you wonder why I'm a, I'm a, you know, Christian. And when, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, like, you know, yo God, like in 2003, like what's up with that? Like, like, you know, you smacked me in the back of the head. <laughs> you could have just tapped me and said, Matt, like you're getting ahead of yourself. You could have just, but Irish Catholic, Irish, hard headed Irishman, you had to hit me pretty hard and you did. And I got the message. Yeah. Thank you. You know, what do we say earlier? Pain, pain is the biggest teacher, right? Like that's, that's yeah. how we grow. Um, yeah. Just a couple things here as, as we wrap up. You you speak um, at some length in, in your book, Rebound, about core values and how important. Yeah. And, and I've had several guests on this podcast, and I find myself almost in every discussion around core values or every podcast around core values because, well, you know, I want you to share your, your, your rationale and your reasons for it because you, you're very serious about the need for them and, and to live by them, to work by them. I would love to hear your perspective. In the book at the time, I didn't really how to know how to describe culture. Um, and now it's become crystal clear through some of my teachings. Coach Smith would say to be a uh, coach is to be, uh, to be a teacher is to be a student all over again. Mm. So as an executive coach, you know, I'm studying, I'm reading books. Yep. I'm, we have guest speakers. I'm a Vistage chair in Charlotte, and we have a great speaker David Friedman, who, who wrote a terrific book, uh, Culture by Design. And when I listened to him speak and, and read his book, all of Coach Smith's teachings just popped, popped from it. And it starts with core values. And why do you have core values? Because you need, you know, it's like you need to have a vision, your mission, where are you going? But it's like, how are you going to get there? How do you want to get there? Like, you could, you could want the same thing I want. You could want to win the national championship. I could want to win the national championship. But you care about certain things that are important to you. I care about other things. And so it's a filter that helps us, like the rudder that steers the ship in the rough seas of leadership. So you filter everything through those core values. And I think you can only have three or four. It's like why you only have three or four numbers in a phone number. You know, you can't remember seven. Yep. So my coach Smith's was play hard, play smart, play together. Mine are respect, trust, commitment, positivity. And so everything needs to be done in a respectful manner, trustworthy, committed, and positive. You know, so now you recruit to it, you train to it, and you can discipline to it. Um, and then how do you activate them? How do you, you know, take them off the wall? I call call. When I, when I do corporate talks, I, I love to say, so who here has core values? And, you know, everyone raises their hands. I'm like, okay, Roger, what are they? And you're like, oh, my gosh. Uh, and Let me go get my ops and, manual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then, you know, oh, I got to look at my website. I'm like, so you need, I call it wall art. Take them off the wall and activate them. And you do that by creating behaviors that are rooted in your core values. And there might be 30 of them. So, you know, like for me, respect. Well, what does that look like? Respect for me might look different from you because you and I grew up in different households in different parts of the country or whatever. So you have to define it. Like, you know, when I coached, uh, all right, I want you to leave the locker room nicer than you found it. That's respect. And so now you repeat those on a, you know, if you have 30 behaviors every 30 days, uh, Coach Smith, 
play hard, play smart, play together. The start of every practice on the practice plan, he'd have the emphasis of the day. Mm. An offensive emphasis might be hit the first open man you see. Well, that was creating the behavior that was rooted in play together. Yeah. So now, now the key is holding people accountable. So, Roger, you're open. I don't pass you the ball. Coach Smith blows the whistle, and, <laughs> and his Kansas twang, he would say, hey, Matthew, why didn't you pass the ball to Roger? And I'd be, I didn't have a good answer, so he'd say, okay, Matthew's team on the baseline. We run a sprint. Now, the worst thing in the world could happen is the next possession, I'm open, you pass me the ball, and I score. And he's like, ah, blows the whistle. Hi, ah, Matthew, aren't you glad Roger threw you the ball? You know? Yeah. And, and that's the consistency and the accountability that it takes to drive a good culture. Yeah. Culture is what you allow. Okay? Yeah. And some people just have a default culture because they don't define it. They don't have core values. They don't have defined behaviors. And they don't hold people accountable to those behaviors. So it's a default, and generally that's not a very good culture. So again, I go back to every organization's made up of talent systems and culture, but culture is the king because you could have average systems, average talent, but if you have a great culture, you're going to be very successful. Yeah. You know, a thing that um, I'll share with you is I learned about core values and really using them in business maybe seven, eight years ago. Of course, every company I ever worked for had them that were in a book somewhere that nobody looked at. But uh, as, as I share with you, uh, Jeff Duden, one of our, our mutual friends is one of my business partners and and really brought that lesson home for me. And that's how we run our, our, our organizations. But I'll tell you, Matt, I if I have one regret of, of raising a family, it's that I didn't have a set of core values for my family. Um, I, I, I'm proud of the father I am. I'm proud of the, of the family we have. But Gosh, that would have made things easier. It just would have made things easier. And I think, you know, there's so many families that would benefit, every family would benefit from on the wall, you know, that's how we hold you accountable. You know, you have to go to your right. room because you didn't do that, you know, or you violated right. that. And um, right. I, I think no, that, that I, I, I brought those to my house and probably need to do a better job of using them on a regular basis because our home is the most important organization we lead. Yep. Right. Yep. So when I do assessments like disc assessments and, you know, I'm a freak on assessments, I do them with my family. Yeah. And, uh, because that is the most important organization, uh, that, that we lead. Yeah, for sure. So you said, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, bring this full circle. You said, um, a little bit earlier that, um, you know, one of the three things that make us up are the books that we read, right? And uh, so I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if there's a book uh, or two, but if, if there's a book that you've read recently or there's a book that you often go back to, I ask this to every guest. And of course, religious texts are, are that's, that's too easy. So, you know, yeah. uh, be, be something that's, that's not a religious text, but is there some, you know, one or two titles that you can recommend to the, to the listeners? Yeah, I, I uh, Rebound from Pain to Passion is probably the best <laughs> book that I've ever <laughs> Right here, guys. Ever. It's, oh, a oh, yeah, yeah. it's a damn good book. It's a damn good book. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. There's so many, I try to read, I, I listen to books mm -hmm. because I'm in the car a lot and I, and I try to listen to at least two books a month and generally I get to three yep. to every, uh, one of my coaching clients. I suggest that they read the first two books I recommend is culture by design by David Friedman okay. about that. I just mentioned, um, how to how to drive a good culture, how to create those core values and the behaviors, and then how to create habits. Um, and then the second one is traction by, you know, e about EOS, mm -hmm. uh, how to run your business. Because I, again, I say every, I call it the organizational triangle. Every organization is made up of talent systems and culture. And, you know, but you need a system. Well, if you don't have a system, EOS, to me, is the best system that's out there if you use starting from scratch. And by reading Traction or what the heck is EOS, you can put some order to the chaos that is your business. And then culture by design uh, to get the culture part right. Because 
you lead with your core values. You recruit to your core values, and that'll scare some people away, which is good. Yeah, which is fine. Because you rather them know that up front, and then when they get there, and then they're like, oh, gosh, this is, I'm, I, they buck the, 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 your core values, where some people then lean into the core values. Well, when Coach Smith recruited me, he talked about play hard, play smart, play together. He told me that I'd be lucky to play by the time I was a junior. Now, I was a high school All-American being recruited by a lot of big schools. Those other schools weren't telling me that. Yeah. So he told me that, and I leaned into it, and I said, I'll show you. And I started as a sophomore. I played as six men as a freshman. And he was testing me, one, will you submit you know, to the core values? Two, will you accept the challenge? Yeah. If you're afraid of that challenge, we don't want you. Love it. I love it. Matt, where um, you, you obviously have a, um, uh, an executive coaching practice as well. So where can people find you? Like, so and we'll put this in the show notes uh, in, in the podcast. So where can people find you? Yeah, thank you. It's uh, my website is dohertycoaching.com. That's D-O-H-E-R-T-Y coaching.com. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, Matt, um, one Thank you for your your candor. Uh, you just um, you told your real story, which is so refreshing these days. Just really appreciate that. I know the listeners will Thank as you. well. And uh, and I can't recommend your book enough. Um, Rebound from pain to passion. Uh, it, it is a very uh, it's an informal rate read, but it's a real read. There's there's some real emotion in it. So I think uh, I know the listeners will really enjoy it. Matt, thank you so thank much you. for your time today. Roger, thank you for your time. Uh, Honored to be on your show. And please tell Jeff I said hello. Will do. Take care. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Thrive More podcast. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes for any resources mentioned during the show. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you have access to the latest and the greatest. I'd also like to remind you to check out our website, thrivemorebrands.com. There you'll find information on the brands we support and information on franchising. Thank you again for tuning in, and until next time, always remember to set your intentions for the day and strive to thrive.